ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Reagan. Thank you all very much, and welcome to the White House. We won't be saying that long, will we? <laughs> well, then you'll just have to drop in the ranch out in California. <laughs> well, you're standing, as I'm sure you know, in the East Room, where the White House historian tells us that Abigail Adams used to hang her laundry to dry. <laughs> Things haven't changed too much now. We. Uh, we have press conferences in here and display our dirty laundry. Well, the East Room, of course, has also been the location for the PBS broadcast of In Performance at the White House, boasting some of the finest musicians and performers in the world, including a couple of comeback performances of my favorite actress, Nancy singing, You're the Top. <laughs> All of you at PBS deserve our thanks for doing such a wonderful job with the In Performance series. You've brought high quality entertainment to the nation, and perhaps this is selfish, but just as important to me, a sense of gaiety and sparkle to the White House. Beverly Sills, Hitchcock Perlman, Leontin Price, Marvin Hamlish, just to mention the masters and mistresses of ceremonies, give a feeling for the quality and variety of in performance. During those events, the, this palace of politics is transformed for the, week, for the evening into a world of culture, bringing a bit of Broadway, classical concerts, jazz, and dance. In a sense, I suppose it's politics way of paying tribute to the finer things in life. The things of joyousness and love of mind and spirit. When Auntie introduced the young artist in performance at the White House series here at, at that series uh, in this room, she quoted a line from Henry James. It is art that makes life, makes interest, makes importance. And I know of no substitute whatever for the force and beauty of its process. Well, you've brought that life, interest, and importance, and a great deal of fun, too, gracing us, gracing the airwaves and homes across the nation with its force and beauty. And for that, we're all very grateful. So let me just say for all of us, thank you very much, and keep up the good work. And then I think I have to conclude a little bit by harking back to you're all here by virtue of entertainment. so. I'll try a little entertainment here before I finish. And, and uh, as Henry VIII said to each of his six wives, I won't keep you long. <laughs> but just the other day, I found an occasion to tell a experience of mine back in the, the d early days when radio was the latest thing. I was a sports announcer at WHO Des Moines. Amy Semple McPherson, the noted evangelist, came to our town. She was holding a series of revival meetings across the nation. Enterprising public relation fella. Our studio thought it'd be a good idea if she were interviewed on our station. Why they picked a sports announcer to interview Amy <laughs> Semple McPherson, I never know. But I did, and I asked her several questions, and then she suddenly went into a very fervent plea concerning the success of her meetings, and I sat down until I happened to hear her saying good night to our radio audience, and I looked up, and there were four minutes to go by the studio clock. I didn't know enough that I could put on the air about Amy Semple and McPherson to fill four minutes, so I got up and did that usual thing on radio. I motioned to the fellow in the control room, and I saw him pick up. There was always a few records lying around for things of this kind. Pick up a record and put it in the turntable and nod, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, in my most dulcet tones, we conclude this broadcast with the noted evangelist, Amy F Semple McPherson, with a brief interlude of transcribed music. <laughs> I expected nothing less than the Ave Maria. 
the Mills Brothers started singing Minnie the Moocher's Wedding Day. <laughs> She didn't bother to say goodbye. She just slammed the studio door on her way out. But, um, you know, now, of course, entertainment has a different flavor if I attempt it anymore. I've become a collector of stories that I can actually certify are told by the Russian people among themselves, which reveals they've got quite a sense of humor, but reveals also that they have a little cynical attitude toward their government and their system. And uh, one of those stories that I, I collect them, as I say, I certify that they're, that's where they're from. And this one was a story that's kind of typical of theirs in which they have an American and a Russian arguing about their two countries. And the American said, look, I can walk into the president's Oval Office and I can pound the desk and say, Mr. President, I don't like the way you're running our country. And the Russian said, I can do that. The American said, you can? He says, yes. I can walk into the Kremlin, the General Secretary's office, pound the desk and say, Mr. General Secretary, I don't like the way President Reagan's running his country. <laughs> and then there's another one that's really based on happening there. You know, only one family in seven in the Soviet Union owned an automobile. And to buy an automobile there it takes 10 years. You have to wait 10 years for delivery. So a fellow had finally gotten the money together and he could buy his car and he went through all the process and finally signed the last papers and uh, gave him the money in advance. And then the fellow behind the counter said, all right, come back in 10 years and get your, your automobile. And the fellow said, morning or afternoon? <laughs> and the man, the man behind the counter, he said, well, what difference does it make 10 years from now? Well, he said, the plumber's coming in the morning. <laughs> I, just, I just saved one more for the get-off room. And then it is, it is getaway time. This one I told to Gorbachev. And he, he laughed. <laughs> there was an order went out, because you know, most of the automobiles are being driven by the bureaucrats there. But an order went out that said, anyone caught speeding gets a ticket, no matter who they are. And one morning, Gorbachev came out of his country home, knew he was late in getting to the Kremlin, told his driver to get in the back seat. He took the wheel and down the road he went, past two motorcycle policemen. One of them took out after him. In a few minutes, he was back with his buddy. And the other one says, well, did you give him a ticket? And he said, no. Well, he said, why not? We're supposed to give anyone a ticket. He says, oh, not this one, no. He was, he was too important. Well, he said, we were supposed to give him to everybody. He said, who was it? He said, I couldn't recognize him, but his driver was Gorbachev. <laughs> That's the way it is around here with summits and everything, just a barrel of laughs. And, you know, <laughs> but now, I know that Nancy has another engagement. It's waiting for her. It really isn't an engagement, it's an assignment. <laughs> and so we're going to have to say thank you all for being here and God bless you all.